Okay, our next uh, five-star recipient is Butte County. Butte County. Let's hear it for all of our five-star award families. And in two years, let's see all 44 counties up here. That'd be, that'd be something. Uh, and this time, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our United States Senator Jim Risch. We're tremendously pleased and privileged to have him with us here today. His list of accomplishments and roles in the United States Senate and in our Idaho state government is too long to possibly read, but former lieutenant governor, former governor of the state of Idaho, and the United States Senator serving on several critical committees for the future of our nation. Please welcome your United States Senator, Jim Rich. much and uh, first things first, uh, Mickey and I want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts uh, for allowing us to represent you in Washington, D.C. Uh, things aren't going well back there and we'll talk about that for a few minutes here, but we do sincerely appreciate that we couldn't do it uh, without the uh, good work that all of you do, so thank you uh, so much. Uh, Vicki sends her regards and uh, I was on the floor of the Senate yesterday afternoon and Mike uh, Crapo had uh, another commitment that he couldn't be here, but he wanted me to uh, extend uh, his warmest wishes to you. I got a great, great partner in uh, Mike Crapo. We try to deliver uh, two votes exactly the same to you each time that we vote on the floor of the U.S. Senate. This morning, well, first of all, I want to uh, thank Father Mike. You know, I, I've been in, uh, I've been associated with this party uh, actively since 1968. I have no idea how many Lincoln days I've been to, conventions I've been to, Republican meetings I've been to, Frequently we start them with a prayer, but I have to tell you, I, I, I was so uh, honored and pleased to see Mike uh, inspire all of you to pray so fervently. That's as fervently as I've seen the public in a long, long time. You know, I'm going to, uh, you've all heard my speech way too many times about the deep, deep financial condition that this country, trouble that this country is in. Financially. And I'm going to touch on that briefly, but I'm not going to dwell on it today. I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of things today. Not for very long, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, but the first one's a little lighter than the second one. The first one, uh, everywhere I go in Idaho, people ask me, they'll say, well, what, you know, what is your, uh, what's your typical day like? What do, you, what do you do during the day when, when you're back in Washington, D.C.? And uh, interestingly enough, uh, we all beat up on the media regularly, frequently, and for uh, good reasons. Uh, but uh, one of them uh, asked if they could come and, and follow me for a day back there and then put together a, a collage of a video of what I actually do during the day. And uh, they did that here uh, last month, uh, NBC affiliate Boise, uh, uh, KTVB did that, and it was Mark Johnson actually who did that. I've known Mark for a long, long time. Uh, Mark is about as even as you can get uh, as far as a uh, reporter goes. And, and I thought they did a really outstanding job of of giving a portrayal of what I do uh, during the day. And so uh, there's two versions of it. One was a, a four minute or five minute teaser that they did. And then they did a, uh, a longer 22 minute version. I'm gonna show you the, the four to five minute version. Uh, if you've got the stomach for it, uh, they are running the 22 minute version uh, uh, right next door to the uh, registration table out there. And, uh, and, and they really did, I, I think, uh, uh, portray visually a, a good representation uh, of what a day is like for me back uh, in Washington, D.C. So I'm going to show you that. I'm going to talk about it just briefly when I'm done with that. And then I want to talk about uh, wh why we do what we do and who we are and, and what the Republican Party means to America and what it means uh, uh, to all of us and, uh, 
and future generations. So, but first of all, uh, uh, let's show this. Jonathan, go ahead and, uh, and start that. This is, this is very brief. Please don't doze off. Imagine a 13-hour work day that includes 14 meetings, 6 miles of walking, 60 handshakes, all of it documented by television cameras. It's a typical day in the life of a U.S. Senator. Photojournalist yeah. Shanti Alsawai and I recently spent the entire day, sun up to sundown, with Idaho Senator Jim Risch in what turned out to be a day filled with voting on a huge issue, as well as dozens of meetings with groups and corporations looking for his help and his vote. The career politician who was elected to Congress in 2009 is in a constant state of motion on Capitol Hill. Tonight on the News at 10, we will show you a job unlike any other. The emotion, the rigors, the struggles that he deals with on a daily basis. A day in the life of Idaho Senator Jim Risch that's coming up tonight on the News at 10. I previewed it, and it's, it's fascinating. I learned a lot that I didn't know before. I, I wish we could show you the entire 13 hours, but we've condensed it down, and you'll see that tonight. Look forward to it. Thanks, Jonathan. And it, like I said, the, they really expanded that as far as the, uh, the kinds of things that, the, that I do during the most important thing I do is uh, obviously is vote. Uh, whenever they call the vote, the library goes off, I have to go to the floor and vote. Uh, but the second most important thing I do is I try to meet with virtually every Idaho uh, that gets back to Washington, D.C. If you're back there, I'm always unhappy if you don't stop by my office. And, uh, frequently, they, they've got to bring you to a meeting or something, but we, I try to spend at least a couple few minutes and, give people an idea of what the, the global picture uh, is back there. Uh, we have committee meetings like we do in the, in the state senate, but they aren't nearly as important in the U.S. Senate for a lot of reasons that uh, I'm not going to take time to go into here. But in any event, if you, any of you do get back to D.C., I hope you will come by the office. I've got a great staff. I've got a great staff here in Idaho also. But the D.C. staff is really good at helping you if you want to uh, get on tours or what have you. Well, enough of that. You know, we're all, we're all, every person in this room is a Republican, and uh, there's a reason that we do this. I get so sick and tired of uh, hearing the, uh, the media, uh, national and, and to some degree the state media, talk about, oh, you know, you Republicans are sheep, the Republican Party tells you to do this, the Republican Party tells you to do that. Look, the Republican Party doesn't tell us to do anything. We are the Republican Party. We do this because we believe in this. And uh, admittedly, uh, when we have issues that are close to the hearts of, uh, of Republicans, we do all do the same. Democrats do the exact same thing. And we belong to a political party because we have a political philosophy. And the political philosophy isn't complicated. We are today engaged in a battle uh, for the heart and soul of the American people, and for that matter, uh, for what our country is going to be in the future. We know what it's been in the past. And for the first 200 years, it was a beautiful thing to behold. Uh, the Founding Fathers sat down and put together a document that constructed a government uh, that took us where we needed to go for 200 years. We lived by it, the American people embraced it, and by and large, the vast majority of people subscribed to what the Founding Fathers had put together. Now, I give this, I, I give this speech uh, frequently to, uh, to high school students, and they'll get to nod along with me, and I say, now, you, you've heard about the Founding Fathers, oh, yes, you heard they wrote a constitution, oh, yes, and they gave us a wonderful document, didn't they, that was constructed to take care of everybody in America and all their problems, right? Oh, yeah. You guys couldn't be more wrong. That's not what they did. That is not what they did at all. What you have to do is you have to put this in perspective of what the Founding Fathers were doing, what was in their minds at the time that they sat around the table and they constructed the United States Constitution. What they didn't do is just as importantly, is just as important as to what they did do. And, and you can argue about what motivated them, you can argue about how this happened, whether it was inspired, whether it happened by accident or what have you, but you can't argue with the results for the first 200 years. The Founding Fathers sat around the table after a, a war of independence from a cruel government uh, where they had just seen their neighbors, their friends, their relatives executed, their property confiscated, and they had just gone through a terrible time of decades of oppression by a monarch from Europe. And these people were all mostly educated people 
who knew about governments, who knew about history. A lot of them didn't want to go. But they knew they had just defeated the royalty. They knew that they were going to have to provide some things. They were going to have to provide, obviously, for internal security, for uh, uh, keep people safe in their homes. And, and most importantly, they were going to have to provide a government that would protect the country. They didn't sit around and say, you know what? How can we construct a government that will provide social welfare programs to take care of all of our fellow colonists who are having a tough time? How can we create a government that will focus on, on equality of wealth and equality of goods amongst all of our people? How can we create a government where everyone will get a trophy? There will all be winners. How can we do that? They didn't do that. They said, okay, if we're going to have a government, let's construct a government that will leave us alone. Let's construct a government that will keep us as far as we can possibly be from the government. Let's create a government that will do as little as possible. Some of them came up with the idea, I'll tell you what, let's create three governments, an executive, a legislative, and a judicial, and they'll fight with each other and leave us alone. <laughs> that actually worked for a while. In any event, what they did was give us a government that empowered the individual, that made the individual and the states the sovereign, that, that gave very limited powers to a central federal government. And indeed, they specifically said in the document that if the power was not enumerated in this Constitution, it belonged to the individual or it belonged to the state, but it did not belong to the federal government. That's how we started. And we did that for about, two, uh, for about uh, 200 years. Somewhere along the line, three and a half, four decades ago, we drifted away from that. And more and more and more people started demanding from the federal government. And more and more and more politicians went back to Washington, D.C. by promising their constituents, if you send me back there, I will give you this. I will vote for this program. I will expand that program. And we all know what's happened over the last three and a half or four decades. America's at a crossroads right now. Never before has this dichotomy been clearer than it is. And, and it's so clear to me in serving in, in the institution that I serve in that I wanted to share that with you a little bit today. Long gone is the, is the argument or the proposition when somebody comes to the floor with an idea well, you know, should the federal government really be doing this? Back there, I can't tell you how many people watch TV or listen to the radio or get a letter from a constituent and say, there's a problem. By golly, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to expand the program. I'm going to start a new program. And as a result of that, we, we've got what we've got today. America is a divided country. The media asks me, why? Why are we polarized? Why, why can't we get along? Why are we so uh, at different ends? And I said, look, this is simple. I, I take them through what I just told you. Half of us believe, as everybody in this room does, that we need a small, constrained federal government, one that will do more than is that's absolutely necessary to defend this country and some other minimalist things. And on the other hand, you've got a group of people who believe that you should have a large federal government with large programs that try to level the playing field for everyone economically and try to right every wrong and create a society where there's no losers, where everybody gets a trophy. That's what a lot of people believe. Now, how, how, what have they accomplished in getting there? Today, 51% of Americans who take in some kind of an income pay no income taxes of any kind. 49% pay 100% of what, the, of what the federal government takes in. Indeed, the top 10% pay 70% of what the federal government takes in. What does the federal government do with that? They subsidize housing. They subsidize food. They subsidize medical care. They subsidize tuition. They subsidize after-school daycare. They subsidize everything you can possibly imagine. And who's the beneficiary of that? It's the 51% that don't pay anything. 
So now you ask the you ask the the, the media asks, why are we divided? We got half the people riding in the wagon, and you got half of the people pulling the wagon. And the people that are riding in the wagon are constantly being told by the other party, you see those people out there pulling the wagon? They're taking advantage of you. Look what they've done. And all you got is a ride in this wagon. And the half of us that are pulling the wagon. <laughs> and the half of us that are pulling the wagon have said, we have had it. We can't do this anymore. And as a result of that, we do have a polarized country. I, I think that the presidential election is going to come down to uh, the, the, how uh, the candidates do in three states, in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida. If you look at all the numbers and you do it however you want to do it, you can talk about all the